I came back from a deployment to Afghanistan back in August and had a list of things to catch up on, certainly in family and life and in business as I came back to my day job. Sat down with my assistant, went through a list and kind of listening and half listening and one of the messages was, and the admiral called, he would like you to. And my immediate reaction was, especially if after being back for about four days from overseas, was just tell him yes. And I'm so very, very, very pleased that it was to receive this honorary doctorate and to deliver this address because President Gaffney calls for many reasons. So <laughs> in, in due time, sir, in due time. So what do we talk about here today? We, uh, I've learned a lot from a lot of great people. Some I've worked with, some I've met, many I've read about. And what I'd like to talk in the short time that I have is about the challenge of leadership. These are really tough times. You read the headlines today, you read the Wall Street Journal in the last week or two, and you see a headline like, economic signals heighten worries of a double dip. Iran plots bombing on U.S. soil. These are tough, unsettling times in this economic crisis, this great recession, whatever you call it, in the second decade now of our nation's wars. I don't know if the wars and the economy and everything that we struggle with in our lives and our families are the cause or the effect. I would argue today that a lot of the challenges we've been through are actually just the effect, that the real cause in so many ways has been a crisis of leadership over the past decade. At times, it has been a failure of political leadership, although we've seen some great leaders on both sides emerge, and we hope and pray they continue to emerge. I promise you this is not a political speech. I will take the advice of a fellow I got to know in the making of extraordinary measures, Harrison Ford. We were talking one night late at dinner, and he's a very engaging and charismatic, remarkable man. We are talking about politics, actually, which you could imagine sitting in a restaurant in Los Angeles talking to Harrison Ford, and in the back of my mind, you're talking about government and politics, and I'm thinking, this is totally cool. I'm having dinner with Harrison Ford. <laughs> but I will take his advice when he asked me, we were talking about Washington, D.C., and maybe opportunities, and he said, well, he said, that's okay, John, but you know what Washington really is. No, Harrison, what is it? He said, well, it's really just Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> True or not, that's one man's perspective, and I'll leave my comments on politics at that, but I'll talk to you, though, not so much about the failures in leadership, because we'd be here a really long time if we talked about political failures, if we talked about business, the failures of leadership. What I'd like to dwell on, though, are the successes, the things and the traits that I've seen in some of the greatest leaders, leaders who have inspired me, my wife Eileen, our family. So I'll leave you with some of these thoughts around some of the traits of great leaders. Take you back to 1976, and there are three examples I'll give you. A really tough time, the oil crisis, another great recession, the end of Vietnam. I was only nine years old and I don't remember much of it, but you can read and know that those were pretty tough times, too. Three different organizations I'll share with you. The industry that I work in, the one I know best, is biotechnology. We make medicines for people with all kinds of challenges, health challenges, diseases. It's a really young business. It's only about 35 years old. And it came together back in 1976 when a young venture capitalist in California read a scientific article, a 29-year-old VC, and he wanted to go visit that university professor out in California at UC San Francisco. So Bob Swanson, that venture capitalist, walked into the office of a Dr. Herb Boyer. He talked, knocked on, literally knocked on his door, and he said, Doctor, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I've read some of these papers, and I've got this firm, and, and we invest in startups, and I, I'm just really excited, and I actually think your technologies, which are really the foundations of DNA research and human genetic engineering to make medicines and live proteins, he said, I think your research can help a lot of people and change the world, and I want to find a way to build a company around it. And the professor had never really thought about that, and 
they got to talking and learning, and the professor started writing on the board, and they both kind of became intrigued by this idea. And then, like all good business plans, they took it from an academic office across the street to a bar across from the university, <laughs> sketched out the ideas of how would you actually build a business around this human, this technology of, of genetics and DNA. And on that cocktail napkin in that bar, after Swanson walked into Boyer's office, became the idea for a company called Genentech, the first biotechnology company ever. Four years later, it went public. Three years later, they really got their first medicine approved. And in the decades that followed to today, a company that now employs tens of thousands of people, a company that's invented medicines like Avastin and Herceptin. If you've had a loved one with breast cancer, colon cancer, their lives have probably been improved, maybe even saved by the scientists at that company called Genentech. So the first trait I'll leave you with is one of vision, to see things when others don't see them, to not sit down with the details of a business plan and bang out all the spreadsheets and PowerPoints, to think about what do you want to create? What's it going to look like 5, 10, 20 years from now? How could it make a difference in people's lives and work backwards from there? 1999, Bob Swanson died of brain cancer, and Herb Boyer was still on the board of Genentech, and he was interviewed for a, an article. And he wrote these words. He said, when Swanson walked into my office, he changed my life. And I think on this convocation, on this day, you think about the importance of dreaming, of vision. You think as a faculty, how many students, how many people knock on your doors, and how many times could that lead to something really big that you could not only change your life, that person's life, but ultimately the lives of millions of other people. The second thing I'll leave you with was also in 1976, and it's interesting, George, you mentioned the Girl Scouts. So here's an organization back in 1976 that had been around for some time, and you probably heard about a lot of great leaders. My guess is few of you have heard of a woman named Frances Hesselbein. So back in 1976, Frances came in as the president and CEO of the Girl Scouts of America. She started by looking at the mission, and she wasn't going to change the mission was to empower young women through community service, an organization at the time that had 600,000 volunteers, 5 million members, even back then a third of a billion dollars in cookie sales. So this was a big organization, and she aimed to change it. And she didn't come in one day and announce with slides or ideas how things were going to change. She built on the mission and shared an expanded vision. And she did two things that were pretty extraordinary, that one of them seems really <laughs> Small, one of them was incredibly substantive. The first small one was she was going to change the symbol. Now, all people in Girl Scouts of America used to wear this pin, this pin, and it was a golden eagle, beautiful. But in 1976, Francis thought that, well, it should be different. We need to expand the face and the membership of the Girl Scouts of America. And she led to, she introduced the new image, which were the three faces of young women, different ethnic backgrounds and was met with a tirade of resistance. People who didn't want to change, or, my god, the eagle is the Girl Scout, you can't change it. And she said, you know what, wear whatever pin you want, but you should wear this one too. And I don't know that there's a lot of golden eagles left, but the three faces and what that laid as a foundation for a future vision for the Girl Scouts was incredibly important. And the second thing Frances did was actually even much, much more controversial. She changed the membership criteria to girls age five and older. And all the volunteers, mostly mothers across America, were outraged. They didn't want to become babysitters. And she said, look, why don't you decide what the proper age is? You don't have to make it five. In that first year, 78 of the 335 councils said, OK, we'll take girls as young as five. And then word got around that this is really renewing the organization. It may actually lay a much better foundation in future. The next year, 225 Girl Scouts of America chapters began accepting young women down to the age of five. Changed the very nature and fabric of that organization. By 1980, all 335 chapters were accepting girls and the Brownies and all those great groups were born. And I think the lesson there is a really important lesson in leadership. Francis stuck to the mission, one that had been around a long time. 
but with and through her team, she made it better. She built upon it. And the lesson, and Francis wrote this years later, she said, you have to give up power to get power. The more power you give away, the more you have. And that's how she changed the face of the Girl Scouts of America. Another great entrepreneur in 1976 had the idea that he could put a company together where they could change the face of computing, personal computing. And yes, that college dropout, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, who went on to, to, to get his undergraduate degree, had the idea that you can create something different and build a company called Apple in the face of what was then companies we probably don't even remember today, like digital equipment and Wang computers. You don't hear a lot about them these days, um, thank, thank God. But in <laughs> against that backdrop with no money at all, a kid who was adopted, who not until decades later ever even met his biologic dad, thought that he could change a really important part of the world and th thought that his vision was really important, but he had this great sense of urgency. So the guys at Genentech had vision too. Francis led change, but what Steve did was do all of that, do it repeatedly, and do it with this remarkable sense of urgency. And I think that's a great characteristic of leaders, and it's shocking to so many of us today to see, whether it's in business, politics, sometimes in academics, the resistance to change, the sense that one day at a time, things will eventually get better. They're not, unless some really brave people step up. And you think about somebody who was the definition of the force for creative change and destruction, somebody like a Steve Jobs, who back in 1993, in another newspaper interview, said this, and I think it really reflects his sense of urgency. He said, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying we've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. The other trait of great leaders that I've seen and, and worked with over the years is that they are risk takers. This is a really risk inverse environment that we live in. Everybody spooked by 2008 and now 9, 10, 11. I know how tough it is for college graduates to pursue their dreams, their careers, the opportunities that many of us had. You know, I graduated got my uh, business degree in the late 90s and went into consulting and then pharmaceuticals and started that little biotech. A lot of my classmates went into the first internet bubble. Some did remarkably well, some not so much, but they came back and they built a career and it's really, really hard today. But what they did, what so many people have done, what the guys at Genentech, what Francis Hesselbaum did, what Steve Jobs did, and so many of the great leaders and innovators is they took risks. They weren't afraid. One of the great quotes, I think, about just making a decision, taking a risk, and sticking to your principles goes back to 1991. As the leaders of the Western world were deciding what to do with Saddam Hussein and the invasion and all of that, and, and you know George Bush the first, very thoughtful, pragmatic president, debating, weighing, and Margaret Thatcher turned to him and said, oh, now, now's not the time to go wobbly on us, George. You think about a lesson in life there about taking risk. That was a big risk with a lot of people's lives on the line. You're going to make mistakes. In fact, you know, a lot of convocation commencement speakers have gotten up and say, oh, it's okay to take risks, and you may fail. You know what? You're probably going to fail, and maybe you should, but that's okay. Think about some of the great inventions of all time. Coca-Cola, Post-it notes, chocolate chip cookies, in my business, Rogaine, penicillin, and yes, Viagra, were all mistakes. Penicillin came about because somebody noticed sitting on a Petri dish that this mold was growing and seemed to kill the bacteria on it when it was left out by mistake too long. Viagra was originally developed as a cardiovascular medicine that failed a spectacular large cardiovascular study. However, they noticed <laughs> some what we call adverse events reported, <laughs> side effects you might call them, very discernible ones, and that was reported, and somebody somewhere had the idea, you know, maybe we can make a medicine out of this, and they did. So it's okay to take risks. You have to. Some of the great leaders I've ever seen are also optimists. They can be pragmatists, realists, yes, face into challenges, acknowledge challenges, 
but they are incredibly optimistic. I'm not going to tell you about anyone so famous. Um, well, she may be famous, um, and if you ever meet her, please don't tell her I said she wasn't famous, but my daughter Megan, who's now 14 years old, who at your very thoughtful uh, uh, introduction can, would have been sitting, had she was not in school today, would have been sitting in the front row rolling her eyes at me like any 14-year-old with words like uh, miracle maker and, and, and stuff like that. But Megan is an incredible optimist. And here's a little kid, and even with the medicine that we created, it helped save her and Patrick's lives, but it didn't cure them. It bought us a lot of time, quality of life, and now hopefully we're coming up this year and next and other companies with next generation therapies. So she still struggles. She's still in a wheelchair, still in a ventilator, and we've developed this little routine over the years. In the mornings when I'm getting ready and we're rushing around and trying to get the kids set for school, and Megan goes to public school every day, now a freshman in high school, and since she's been about the third or fourth grade, she'll come rolling in in her motorized wheelchair, and I'm shaving or cleaning up. And I'll ask her a question probably every dad asks every one of their kids every day. How are you doing today? And she answers still today, years later, with the same one-word answer. Awesome. She said, I'm awesome. And here's a little kid. And I bet you if you saw her in the debt walking or rolling down the street, and I gave you a sheet of paper, and I ask you to write down 100, 1,000 adjectives. I think a few of us would choose the word awesome, but that's how she sees herself. Yes, she has challenges, but she also has incredible gifts to share with the world. And that sense of optimism, you know, it's so easy for us as big people to feel sorry for ourselves and our, you know, our jobs aren't good or family life is not good or we don't have enough money, whatever it may be, to think, you know, life ain't fair. And sometimes it's not. But that sense of optimism, the sense of living for each day, and that sense of grace and peace is something amazing that I've seen in my daughter. Another trait in great leaders that I've seen is sacrifice. You have to work hard. We all want to play hard, and that's healthy too. But hard work is the price of success, and you have to sacrifice. You sacrifice in your academic studies, faculty sacrifices in devoting a career to education. Remarkable challenge, in many respects, the most important job in society today. Your parents sacrificed to send you here as their parents and grandparents struggled and sacrificed. Great leaders realize the nature of that sacrifice, and they don't have to be famous people. They don't have to be successful entrepreneurs. As I was leaving Afghanistan this summer, we were at the Bagram Airfield, a big Air Force base where a lot of command centers and then a lot of people rotating in and out of the country. And I was in this air terminal, and you think it's tough being stuck in a U.S. air terminal waiting for a delayed flight. Try sitting in an Air Force facility where there's no air conditioning, there's no food, a couple bottles of water. And you're sitting there, and you're like, you know, I've been away for a while, and I, I really want to get home, and God, you know, I've done this and done that and been here and been there. I just want to get home, and you're waiting four, five, six, seven hours for a delayed Air Force transport. And I looked up and, and uh, I saw this big poster. And it just it was the only decoration in this pretty stark facility. And it had a silhouette of US troops. And uh, all it said was, I think, very simply but very powerfully, lead a life worthy of their sacrifice. You don't have to serve in the military to sacrifice. Most don't, and that's OK. There's so many different ways you can sacrifice for yourself, for your country, for your family. But you think about the sacrifice that so many in the military do make. Some who spend so much of their time, especially this last decade, away from family, many of whom were so horribly injured in war, and thousands who have given the ultimate sacrifice. It is just that. It is a sacrifice, and all great leaders realize it's an important part of who they are and what they do, however they sacrifice. And this last trait I'll leave you with is courage. Seems simple enough to say that you've got to lead from the front, you've got to be courageous. Um, one of the great leaders of all time, you know, the faculty obviously is incredibly well read, and I'm sure many of the students have spent an awful lot of time in the library reading. I'd ask you to read one document if you can. Read Martin Luther King's Letters from a Birmingham City Jail. It is a remarkable piece of writing. It's incredibly pow 
powerful for its passion, but also for its calmness and its deep sense of urgency and its perspective. And I'll just read these words that Dr. King wrote. He said, we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom, abused and scorned though we may be. Our destiny is tied up with the destiny of America. Incredibly powerful words, that's courage, but it's something more. You could take every adjective you can think of when you think about leadership and roll it into that document, roll it into those words, and he knew that it, however you define it, was bigger than him. He knew that he was literally living and writing history. He knew that his time in this earth may be very, very short indeed, but he was determined to leave a legacy greater than himself. That was rising to the challenge of leadership. Dr. King's one of probably a very, very small number of people who have literally changed the world. I guess this is where I'm supposed to stand here and tell you now, go out as educators, faculty, administration, students, and change the world. Um, you probably can't, and maybe you probably shouldn't. You think about what uh, my wife Eileen and I and our family and so many wonderful friends and strangers who came to help people with this little rare disease called Pompeii disease did. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of luck, and a lot of passion. We didn't set out to change the world. Extraordinary Measures ends with my driving Megan away in a convertible where she's finally strong enough after the medicine to start sitting up again, which was incredibly exciting and very true in life. And, and the movie ends with that beautiful Eric Clapton song, Change the World. Um, we didn't change the world. We didn't set out to. But what we set out to do is to change a tiny little piece of the world that for us meant all the world. And maybe that's what your greatest contribution can be. Pick your little piece of the world. Build a great and lasting vision. Lead through change. Be urgent about it. Take smart risks. Be an optimist. Always sacrifice. And be courageous. Know that now is not the time to go wobbly on us. And thank you. Thank you for this great honor. And may the good Lord take a liking to you, but not too soon. Thank you.